From the American Neurological Association, I'm Adeline Goss. This is ANA Investigates. Brain death is one of the most controversial and ethically complex topics in neurology. But at the same time, for many neurologists, including me, it's a regular part of our clinical practice. Late last year, a new set of guidelines were published that address some of the thorniest technical and ethical issues in the clinical determination of brain death. And unlike previous guidelines, the 2023 update addresses brain death determination in both adults and children. The guidelines were published by the American Academy of Neurology, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Child Neurology Society, and the Society of Critical Care Medicine. Two of their authors join us today, Dr. Ariane Lewis and Dr. Matthew Kirshen. Dr. Lewis is a professor in the Departments of Neurology and Neurosurgery and the Director of the Division of Neurocritical Care at NYU Langone Medical Center. Dr. Kirshen is an Assistant Professor of Anesthesiology and Critical Care at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania and the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. They were interviewed by Dr. Masoom Desai of the University of New Mexico. Here's Masoom. Let's extend a warm welcome to Dr. Lewis and Dr. Kirshen. Thank you for having us. Happy to be here. My first question is for Dr. Kirshen. Much of what we talk about today centers on the 2023 Joint Guidelines for Death by Neurological Criteria. To ground our discussion, can you tell us what function this guideline serves and how it relates to federal and state law surrounding brain death? So we convened a group to begin to revise the prior 2010 and 2011 adult and pediatric guidelines several years ago with the hope of standardizing the process for brain death determination and bringing the adult and pediatric guidelines into a single document. We really wanted to focus on the medical determination of brain death in this document. We recognize that There may be different legal requirements in different states, but really the focus of this document was to standardize the process for the medical determination of brain death. Thank you. Turning our attention to the practical implications of these guidelines, Dr. Lewis, the 2023 Joint Society Guidelines represent a significant evolution from the previous standards set in 2010 and 2011. Could you discuss how these updates might transform routine clinical practice of declaring brain death? This is a really important question. The focus of the new guidelines is on being as conservative as possible to ensure that there's no false positive determinations of death. The article that came out in Neurology Clinical Practice that compares the old guidelines to the new guidelines and reviews the specific differences in terms of the prerequisites, the clinical exam, apnea testing, and ancillary testing. Broadly, there's no major changes in the process, meaning that the process for the determination of death still requires identification of a clear etiology by which the patient developed permanent catastrophic brain injury to the entire brain, and additionally, identification that there are no other factors that could make it appear as though the patient meets criteria for death when they don't, for example, low temperature or low blood pressure or drugs in their system. And the clinical exam is similar in process to what has been described previously, as is the apnea test and the use of ancillary testing. The differences really are in the degrees of description as to how these processes should be undertaken. So, for example, the prior adult guidelines for brain death determination indicated that the temperature needed to be at least 36 degrees Celsius in order to conduct the evaluation. The new guidelines indicate that If the temperature has been less than 35.5 degrees Celsius for any amount of time prior to conducting the evaluation, it's necessary to rewarm the patient to 36 degrees Celsius for 24 hours prior to conducting the exam. So it's really just providing a stronger degree of conservatism and exactitude about how the evaluation should be conducted. And that's one example of that. Dr. Kirshen, Amongst other changes, the 2023 joint guidelines cover both adult and pediatric patients. The guidelines also outline some differences in brain de- declaration between adult and pediatric patients. Why are these differences necessary? Sure. So where we could, we try to really standardize the process by which brain death is determined across the lifespan. There are a few areas where 
neonatal and pediatric physiology dictate that a slightly different process needs to occur. And a few of those examples are when talking about the prerequisites and looking at drug metabolism. You really want to make sure that all medications and potential toxins are cleared out of the patient's system so that they can't confound the examination. And neonates and children process medications sometimes differently than adults do. So those differences in medication clearance times need to be taken into consideration. We also know that the primary mechanism by which kids sustain catastrophic permanent brain injury that leads to brain death is hypoxic ischemic brain injury, typically from cardiac arrest rather than from trauma in the adult population. And we also know that in infants and young children, the brainstem is more resistant to that hypoxic ischemic insult as well as they have an open fontanelle that may prevent the brain from experiencing the same consequences of the refractory intracranial hypertension from the cerebral edema. And so because of that, we recommend waiting longer after the brain injury prior to proceeding with the brain death evaluation to ensure that the injury is permanent and that there will be no recovery of any brain function. Additionally, in pediatrics, it is required to do two neurological exams and apnea tests. And in adults, one neurologic examination is required, although there is the possibility to do a second examination to minimize the possibility of false positive determinations. However, only one apnea test is required in adults. Another difference between children and adults in the guidelines has to do with ancillary testing in the transcranial Doppler evaluations are only acceptable ancillary tests in adults, really due to a lack of data in children. Thank you. Dr. Kirshen, in your experience, how does allowing family members to be present during the testing for brain death impact their understanding and acceptance of this diagnosis? In general, when talking about the amount of time that we observe patients for recovery of neurologic function, after their brain injury and before initiating the brain death evaluation, we really wanted to emphasize and prioritize that amount of time, that that amount of time should really be based on the pathophysiology of the individual patient's brain injury, taking their neuroimaging into consideration. And you really need to wait a sufficient amount of time in order to be confident that the brain injury is permanent. We give recommendations that if you are two years old or greater and you've had hypoxic ischemic brain injury, that you should wait at least 24 hours. And we recommend in children less than two years old that you observe for at least 48 hours. We recognize that those time intervals are arbitrary, but what we really want to emphasize is that the clinician at the bedside needs to wait a sufficient amount of time based on the pathophysiology of that particular patient's injury to feel 100% confident that their injury is permanent and that the patient will have no recovery of any neurologic function. Thank you for sharing those insights into the detail of the clinical examination and the time between the two examinations in pediatric population. I also understand that you have done some work looking into the variability of brain testing and specifically ancillary testing across the world. Could you highlight the specifications that need to be followed for these tests to be performed at different centers? So there have been a number of studies looking at brain death policies in hospitals in the U.S. that have demonstrated that there's inconsistency between the U.S. hospital policies and the prior standards. This is quite problematic because it's important to ensure that the brain death evaluation is consistent between practitioners, between hospitals, and across states. So one thing that we really encourage everyone to do in reading the new guidelines is to ensure that they update their hospital policies to ensure that they're in line with the new guidelines so that the brain death determination process is consistent and conservative and accurate throughout the country. As you mentioned, prior studies have demonstrated that there's also variability in terms of national standards for brain death determination around the world. Uh, The World Brain Death Project's goal was to try and help to standardize the minimum standards for brain death determination in countries around the world. 
But right now, with respect to the new ANAP, CNS, and SECM guidelines, our focus is on having all hospitals in the United States align their hospital policies with these standards. Thanks for highlighting that very important point of being updated with the current guidelines in terms of the hospital policies, which is crucial to conduct the brain testing in the most appropriate way. So continuing our conversation further, the concept of loss of functions of the entire brain has always been a cornerstone of brain dead determination. Dr. Lewis, in the light of cases like Jahi McMath, where neuroendocrine functions persisted, how did your group approach the definition of loss of all functions of the entire brain? The Uniform Determination of Death Act indicates that the determination of death by neurologic criteria requires irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain, including the brain stem. There are some individuals who argue that that requires there to be loss of neuroendocrine function, that that's part of that. Now, notably, there's no country in the world that requires loss of neuroendocrine function when declaring death by neurologic criteria. The prior AAN guidelines and the prior pediatric guidelines did not require loss of neuroendocrine function in order to declare death by neurologic criteria. And the current guidelines specifically indicate that loss of neuroendocrine function is not required for the declaration of death by neurologic criteria. What the new guidelines stipulate is that the interpretation of the phrase irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain, including the brain stem, should be taken to mean permanent coma, loss of brainstem reflexes, and loss of the ability to breathe spontaneously in the setting of an adequate stimulus. So instead of taking the anatomic approach that the Uniform Determination of Death Act takes to the consideration of death by neurologic criteria, the new guidelines and similarly the World Brain Death Project and also guidelines throughout the world focus on the functional approach to what loss of functions are needed in order to declare death by neurologic criteria. Thank you for those insights. Dr. Kirshen, are there any updates in the 2023 guidelines as to having a clear statement that no consent is required for plain death determination? Yes. In the 2023 guidelines, there is an explicit statement that consent is not required to initiate a brain death evaluation. However, it is good clinical practice in order to inform families that an evaluation will take place. Have you come across instances where you've had challenging situations with families refusing to proceed with the brain death testing and how have you handled that in your clinical practice? Yes, there are situations in which families are hesitant or object to proceeding with a brain death evaluation. I will say that since consent is not required and we are informing families that the evaluation is going to take place, it is not typical to ask permission for families to proceed with the evaluation, although sometimes families do object. And I think the important thing to do is to take a step back and to have some further conversations with the families to try to understand the reason for the objection. There's a variety of different reasons why families may object to brain death testing. Some of it may come from misunderstandings about the concept of brain death. It can be quite challenging when you have a patient who is lying in a bed, they've got stable vital signs on the monitor, they are warm to the touch, their chest goes up and down with the ventilator, they have normal bodily functions. To understand how they could be alive one minute and dead the next minute after brain death testing has occurred. And so sometimes it requires taking a pause and providing education for the family. Sometimes it has to do with miscommunication about what the family has heard or they understand what is going on. Sometimes really the family is hoping for recovery. And other times some families have religious objections or personal moral objections about their beliefs about life and death in terms of what criteria should be used to declare death. And I think each one of those situations needs to be handled differently. It is often beneficial to involve medical leadership and then various other groups from the hospital that may be helpful so that the evaluation for death determination can proceed. Thanks for these comprehensive insights into challenging this difficult topic. 
I also wanted to know from you if you felt in your clinical practice that it's beneficial for family members to be present while the testing is being performed to better understand the concept of brain death and be more accepting of that. We recommend in the guidelines that it may be helpful for families to observe the brain death evaluation, including the clinical examination and the apnea test. And I think it can be helpful for families when they see the rigorous nature with which we try to get responses from patients as part of the very standardized and comprehensive neurologic examination, when they see the extent of the painful stimuli and the variety of stimuli that we try to use and the lack of brainstem reflexes, and then watching a loved one be disconnected from the ventilator and not have any spontaneous respirations during the apnea testing period can also help the families come to terms with not only the components of the evaluation, but also the uh, severity, permanence, and irreversibility of their loved one's catastrophic brain injury. Well, thank you for your insights into that topic. As we wrap up the discussion today, what do you see as the current gaps in the science surrounding brain death? So I think there are many unanswered questions and many future areas of research that need to be conducted in the brain death arena, both in adults and children. We need more research around ancillary tests and specificity and sensitivity of ancillary tests across the age spectrum. We need more data on tests like CTA and MRA. Many of the things in the brain death evaluation are physiology-based and have not been subjected to the same rigorous evidence-based study as other things in medicine. Uh, For example, the CO2 and pH targets During apnea testing, there is room to evaluate those across the lifespan. Would there be indications to have different targets in infants, younger children, and adults? And so I think there are several unanswered questions within the brain death space. And the guidelines have a section towards the end where we talk about research priorities going forward, as well as there's an excellent section of the World Brain Death Project that also addresses similar research priorities. I think it's also important to recognize that the new guidelines, as with the World Brain Death Project, are a consensus statement. So this was not based upon a review of the literature and analysis of the evidence, because that's just not the way that brain death can be declared and that decision-making about the process of brain death determination can be designed So rather, this was a new process that was put together by the American Academy of Neurology Guidelines Committee to create these guidelines via a consensus process rather than via review of the evidence. Well, thank you, Dr. Lewis and Dr. Kirshen, for sharing your expertise with us today. That was Dr. Ariane Lewis and Dr. Matthew Kirshen, interviewed by Dr. Masoom Desai. ANA Investigates is the official podcast of the American Neurological Association. The show's producers are members of the ANA Education Innovation Committee, chaired by Dr. Michelle Johansson. I'm Adeline Goss, neurohospitalist, podcast host, and executive producer. Our program was produced today by Dr. Masoom Desai, Caitlin White, and me, with help from Jen Hurley. You can listen to past episodes of the show, subscribe so you never miss an episode, and access all of the ANA's educational programs on the Education tab at myana.org. That's it for ANA Investigates. See you next month.